I thought you might like to know the story about the spunky old broad and how it came to be and, and kind of what I've done with my life. So my first recollection is really around the age of three. Now this has been tempered a little bit by stories from my mom, but actually my first dance recital was at the age of three. And I was January. They were doing the 12 months of the year and I was first out because I was January. And part of my recital was to do a somersault. So I did and my crown fell off and I put the crown on but I evidently put it on backwards because uh, I had the elastic in the front and the peak and crown in the back and the crowd started laughing. So my mom tells me that I put my hands on my hips, I cautioned the band to stop playing, I waited until everybody calmed down and as soon as they were through I put my uh, crown back on properly and told the band to start playing again and off I was and she said she knew that she never have to worry about me from that point on and I remember from a very early age at three or four or five because I was a pianist too I made a lot of uh, I made up a lot of piano music and played and I was supposed to be a little child prodigy but uh, really started playing the piano really about five or six but I remember at that time uh, telling my mom that I wanted a career, that I was never going to be ready to get married, and that this was the thing that was most important to me. And I went through my uh, grammar school years without too much incident, but when I got to be about 13, I realized how important earning a living was because I had broken 22 pair of glasses. And my father told me if I broke another pair, I was going to have to pay for them. Well, I went up to the optometrist's office and my father was waiting in the car by the curb and I brought down my 23rd pair of glasses and I put them on the seat of the car and promptly sat on them and broke them. We had not even pulled away from the curb yet. So my uh, father said, uh, you know what this means? And and I said, I know I have to pay for them. And the only thing available at that time to a, a young girl in Albany, New York, which is where I was born, uh, was to babysit. And so uh, I just thought that was terrible. I was not a good babysitter and I didn't want to be a babysitter. So I asked my father if I could get a real job. Well, he said, if anybody will hire you. Now, well, remember, this was the 50s. So I went through the newspaper and decided that I would make a perfect Avon lady. So I started selling Avon cosmetics from door to door at the age of 13. I became the top salesperson in the whole area because I was very little. And so I would knock on people's doors with my little black bag. And of course, people were home then because it was the 50s and women weren't working. I would uh, come in, they would let me in. I would sit on their sofa, I would sit down on the couch and I wouldn't get up again until they bought. And really nobody knew what to do with me. So uh, they all bought from me and, and it was very successful. But every year I wanted to do something different. So when I was 14, I decided that I wanted to work in a summer camp and I wanted to teach dance and music and drama. And I went to the camp director and told him this is what I wanted to do. And he said, you can't do that. We don't have anyone like that. And I said, I know. That's exactly why I need to be there and you need to hire me. So after much ado, uh, he did hire me. And I wrote uh, and composed a, a production for the end of the uh, camp year. We uh, danced. I wrote the music for it. And we did the choreography. And we created the costumes and so forth. And we put on this show. And it was interesting because every year after that, for 20 years that he owned the camp, he hired somebody to do exactly what I did. Then when I was 15, I decided that uh, I wanted to work in a radio station. So um, I went and took two buses every day to get to the radio station, two buses to get home, and I was there every day for two weeks. And finally the general manager came out and said, who are you? And I said, well, I'm here to get a job. And he said, well, we don't have any job for someone like you. And I said, well, I know you don't, but I will be here every day until you find one. And they hired me. And that summer, I got a wonderful education. I not only did commercials, but I also, well, I did everything. I was the traffic person. I cleaned out their record library. At that time, that's all they had were records. I answered the phones. I I think I even swept floors, I'm not sure, but I certainly did a lot of everything. So that was the year I was 15. And then I was 16, I uh, went to work uh, for the State Department during the summer and I was typing checks and my, my, my mother said it was a great job and it was a job that everybody wanted to get into full time after they graduated high school because it was secure, it was working for the state, a lot of benefits. Well, I couldn't believe that people did this their entire life and for the rest of their life. So I told her I didn't want to do that anymore and she told me I had to have something that earned money over the summer. So I decided to start modeling 
And of course, I didn't know how to model, but she told me if I wanted to model, I had to pay for the course myself, and I had to learn how to model. So that's exactly what I did, and I earned my money modeling over the summer, uh, posing for different people. I wasn't very tall, so I, I couldn't do a lot of runway work, but I did do some print work and some things like that. And now I was 17 years old and I went off to college. And when I went to college, I did a lot of things. I took in dry cleaning when I was a freshman. I transferred schools and I started uh, modeling in Boston, which is where I ended up going to school at Emerson College in Boston. And I'm very proud of that school. As a matter of fact, I just finished a 10 year uh, on their board of uh, overseers. So I've been very active with the school. And I did a lot of drama there, a lot of radio shows. I had a lot of radio shows there because they were famous for that and they still are. And TV was just really coming into its own. So I had a wonderful time there and I really didn't have time to work because I decided I wanted to get out in three years. So I went to summer school, I went to night school because I wanted to finish. So when I graduated early without my class, I decided that I wanted to live in Miami. It was the only warm place I knew other than LA. So I gave myself two weeks to make it. I gave myself two weeks to come to Miami, find the job I wanted, and if I didn't, I was moving to LA. Now remember, this was the 50s, so nice girls didn't do that back then. My parents were very chagrined. They didn't know what to do with me, but they said okay because I was paying my own way to come. And uh, I ended up getting the job I wanted on the 14th day. Now, it was in a modeling school. It was uh, for 35, actually it was for $13 a week in the beginning. And then I was trying to figure out how I would live on $13 a week when the owner said to me, you know, I'm gonna fire my other girl and hire you full time because you are gonna make money for somebody. So I started off at $35 a week. And as I was trying to figure out how I was gonna live on $35 a week, I learned in that first two weeks I was there more than I ever could have hoped to know because my boss never came in. So questions were coming in on the telephone like crazy. And I would write everything down on a yellow pad and when she called in two, three times a day, I would find out the answers and I never had to ask a question a second time. Within a month, I had figured most things out. I had tripled my salary. I was now making about $100 a week and I was uh, also learning how to teach classes. I was learning how to book models. I was doing everything. Then I went home uh, about, oh, eight months later for a vacation to see my parents. I hadn't seen them since I had moved. And uh, I got a phone call and she was gonna sell the business. And she asked me if I wanted to buy it and I said, I didn't think so. And then after I slept on it for 24 hours, I thought, well, why don't I? This is exactly what I want to do. But of course I had no money. So I bought it for no money down and uh, made arrangements to pay her off over a three year period did that and then opened my second studio and then developed it into a chain of career schools. I had uh, not only the modeling, but I had real estate and court reporting, legal and medical secretarial, fashion merchandising. We were the largest independent career school in the state of Florida. We also had the largest talent agency where we were SAG and AFTRA, which meant that we did union movies and commercials. And then I opened a convention service company, which did tours and industrial shows and theme parties and all kinds of things for the various hotels that were very popular again in the um, late 60s early 70s in South Florida so I ended up with seven offices seven locations I had geez thousands of students I had at that time I must have had a thousand students going through the schools and I had like 350 people between the models the talent the actors the teachers the, the secretaries the court report is everybody about 350 people who were in my employ. Then uh, I always spoke, I always did speaking as a part of what I did to promote my school because I started out with no money, so that was the easiest thing for me to do. I knew how to speak. Um, I had given many speeches coming from Emerson and it was something I loved to do. And I booked a lot of speakers uh, as part of the convention service company. So. 
Some of the speakers were very well known. Bill Gove, who was the first president of the National Speakers Association. Sam Edwards, who was a CPAE, which is the highest designation you can be awarded. And so they told me, Gail, you're a good speaker. You need to be a speaker too. But I was so busy with the business, I just didn't have time for it. But finally, Sam said to me, Gail, you have to go. Well, the convention was in two weeks. I, I went and I paid my money and I got my ticket and off I went to this convention. That was 1980. And in 1980, I sold my business because I found out I could make a living full time as a professional speaker. And so uh, I put my business up for sale on a Friday. It was sold on Monday and I became a speaker. And it took me about nine months. I, I, what I did was I got on the phone and I called 100 meeting planners a day, 500 a week. I really didn't care who said no. I only cared who said yes. And within eight to nine months, I was doing 135 to 150 programs a year. Now, 21 years passed in that time. I became not, I went from, I did it in an opposite way than most people do it. I was a keynote speaker first, then went into speaking in workshops and seminars, became a trainer, became a consultant, then went back to keynote speaking at the very end, which is kind of what I'm doing now. But I ended up going to 50 countries and that was all paid for, trips that were paid for. It was a marvelous experience. I was able to take my husband during this time. And yes, incidentally, I did get married during this time and raised a family. And uh, then I, I was in 49 states. And the one state people always ask me, the one state I was not in was North Dakota because they did not see any value to me or for me at all. I, I once offered my services for a dollar just to say I had been in all 50 states and they wouldn't even hire me for a dollar. So I ended up in 49 states and 50 countries and then 9-11 happened. And a lot of things happened in the five years following that. The whole speaking industry changed at that time. My husband became very ill. My oldest son passed away. I had custody of a grandchild. I was with my, I had had breast cancer twice and now I had now my third uh, breast cancer situation. So it was, it was a difficult time. And that is when I went from being the whiz of biz, which is what I had been known as because I was a very good businesswoman, to the SOB, the spunky old broad. But it was hard getting started as a spunky old broad because I was caring for my husband and I was doing a lot of other things. So um, I wrote a book called How to Be an SOB, A Spunky Old Broad Who Kicks Butt. And I had had another book, another book which was a business book, Winning Ways, How to Get to the Top and Stay There. And that did extremely well. It was published by Berkeley and it was in, uh, well, a lot of the countries I went to, there was my book. So it was in, I don't know, at least 12 countries. And now I was part of this spunky old broad brand. Branding. But it was tough because I was working at that. I was handling our real estate because my husband couldn't any longer. I had started an Internet Information Marketing Association with my uh, cohort, Tom Antion, and I had done a lot of other things, and I was just busy. I became a vice chair of the Institute of Management Consultants, and I was very busy with my volunteer activities as well. But then this past year, my husband passed away, and it is now my opportunity to get going again as a spunky old broad. So uh, I've just shot three workout videos because working out is very important to me. I work out two hours every day. Uh, I have a radio show for women in business, and I also have a radio show, SOB Radio, which features women who are doing fantastic things, who are over the age of 50. And I also am doing a lot of other things. I'm, I'm, I've created a Spunky Old Broad Day, which morphed into a Spunky Old Broad Month, and we're awarding our first Spunky Old Broad Award this year. And uh, I'm also doing now teleseminars. I have e-zines that go out. I have a lot of tips. We take women on fantastic trips. Uh, we're starting uh, our own vitamin product because I do believe in, in vitamins and I think they contribute to your health and to your energy. And I think that's one of the reasons I was able to get through chemo, radiation twice a day, all of that, because I was basically in good physical health. So all of those things have conspired to make the spunky old broad who she is right now, 
We have created a Spunky Old Broad Club. We have a Spunky Old Broad training site. So we are doing a lot of things where women can join with us and enjoy being with other women who are like them, who are their age, who enjoy the same kinds of things they do. And our next endeavor after this will be the merchandising of the SOB. T-shirts, bracelets, jewelry, different, various different kinds of things that we'll be offering on our site. But that's how I've gotten to where I am right now. And I, my whole joy is showing you that it's not over until it's over. To me, it doesn't matter how old you are, you can always start your own business. You can always become physically active. You can always learn a new language. You can do whatever it is you want to do. So my message to you SOBs out there is come join us. We'd love to have you. We are a great group. We're lots of fun. We're adventurous. We're spunky. We have a great time and we want you with us.